have a lot of passion for what you're doing. This rings true because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, and if you're not having fun doing it, you're gonna give up. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of John's Entitled Podcast, a partner of MoshPitNation.com. This episode's guest is Mr. John Clayton, vocalist and programmer for legendary band Pit Shifter. And speaking of legendary frontmen, I have Mr. Daniel Terry with me. How are you doing? Pretty good. I've never been called a legendary frontman before, but uh, I like it. I'm going to just start uh, putting that on all my socials. There you go. Just like Daniel Terry captioned, legendary frontman. Of what? Well, it's legendary. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you're not in. That must be your problem because you don't know why I'm legendary. I'm definitely not as legendary as Pitch Shifter. Um, I'm a pretty big fan and pretty uh, pretty sad I didn't get to do the chat, but it's my own damn fault for having a life and kids and all that good shit. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping you would be able to join me on this, and sadly, you know, kind of last minute you were not able to, which is fine. Um, I don't even know if I asked you on this one, like what you had questions for, but you know, it's no. kind of, it's, it's kind of the fun thing sometimes when I send you these and, you know, we work on trying to work together, especially if we think we're going to be doing an episode together with somebody, um, is trying to be like, Hey, what kind of questions would you ask? So at least like you're still somewhat involved. And when you're not, I'm always like, I wonder if Dan, when he listens to these, is like, oh, this fucking dude's not asking the que- the right questions. No, I mean, I think you pretty well covered it from a fan. Um, you definitely came off as somebody that knew the band. I know some of these interviews can be a little rough. Sometimes people are just throwing bands at us left and right. But for a band like Pitch Shifter, I mean, they're prolific enough to where it doesn't matter who you are. You've heard Pitch Shifter songs or albums, you know. <laughs> And uh, but no, I feel like in the interview, you, uh, you you pretty much hit on some of the things that uh, that I would have asked. I really, uh, really enjoyed the discussion about how they just felt like they weren't being booked right at first, like putting uh, being put on with death metal bands, because I know one of the questions I was going to ask is like, you know, what was it like being associated with earache records, you know, being more of a predominantly death metal label? And, you know, being with all these bands that you don't really sound like, you know, you're, you're not really in that scene, um, but you're on this label that, that really kind of only knows how to promote that. You know, I know they weren't on Earache forever, but, you know, um, they, they had a couple of releases on there and uh, or maybe it was distributed by Earache. But that whole thing about whenever they went to play the Napalm Death show and the guys were like, so let's see it. And he's like, <laughs> see what? He's like, he's like, let's see it, you know. He's like, see what? They're like the drum machine. What does it? What does it do? You know, it's like it's it's a it's a computer. It's not a. It's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, even even back then, it probably would have been pretty primitive. Now, I mean, most people's drum machine is a MacBook. You know. Right. But uh, but you know, even back then, you know, those poor guys were so underwhelmed. I think uh, by what the reality of the drum machine was, and I thought that was really cool. Um. But I did like how you countered too that like as a promoter yourself that you know it's kind of good to have a huge diversity uh, of sounds in in one show. You know, you get like a hip hop band and an electronic band and a metal band, and you know you throw them all in there because you're kind of casting a pretty wide net for who's going to show up and buy beer. I mean, that's that's what we're all here for, right? Yeah, typically. I mean, that that's kind of the thing. And, you know, I've kind of beaten it to death a little bit by saying, you know, new metal was a wide casting net by incorporating styles of hip hop, metal, industrial, punk rock. Like if you go back and basically were to take anything tagged as new metal and just kind of looked at it, you'd be like, wow, this is a very diverse assortment of a very eclectic assortment of bands. And to me, that was the the really cool thing about that era. And I think a band like Pitch Shifter, you know, I was trying to think like, would a band like Pitch Shifter work now with the big EDM scene as the way it is, or would it still be very much a a weird, like fringe niche band? I think it would still be kind of niche because they are, 
a wide array of sounds within themselves anyway. You know, a lot of bands might have experimented or whatever, but like Pitch Shifter took it to a different level. There are no two Pitch Shifter albums that sound the same. There's no generic Pitch Shifter sound. And um, a band like that, I think, is always going to have trouble gaining a huge mainstream success. Um, so I think that they would always be considered an underground band anyway. And, you know, like you even said in the interview, he's like, we, if our goal was to make money, you know, we would sound like Incubus or <laughs> something like that, you know. Um, but there, it seems like their goal was always just a well. What, what other cool thing can we do here? Yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, again, it was just it was <laughs> it was very weird to me how how this interview came about. Like, you know, sometimes that's the fun thing about doing these podcasts is you know, like one will just beget the other one so oddly, and it's like I didn't think when I got the interview with Jason Bold that like a week later I'd be talking to the singer of Pitch Shifter as a result of it, right. It was just very, very weird how that happened. Well, they played ball and they shared the episode, and it's like, well, you know what? I want to talk to the guys that are all in. You know? <laughs> so. No, that, that's that's totally true. Um, and uh, yeah, speaking of uh, being all in, let's get all into this conversation with Mr. John Clayton of Pitch Shifter. <laughs> So I have the sure. pleasure this uh, this early evening of talking to Mr. John Clayton, vocalist and programmer for, I would say, legendary uh, band Pitch Shifter, who are back from a about a decade long hiatus, uh, getting ready to celebrate wow, twenty years of PitchShifter.com. How oh are you God. doing? <laughs> I was great until you said the twenty years bit. No, feel uh, like a granddad. I mean, you know, it ages me too because uh, I mean, when that record came out, I was I was in high school, so. Um, it's, it, it definitely makes me feel old too. And I realize now albums that I grew up with that don't feel that old to me. I go, I have two decades with this material. Uh, so it, it puts it back on me too. So I got another kicker. I was uh, looking on the socials, which is a blessing and a curse, right? It's a good <laughs> idea and a mistake. So, and then there's one guy's like, screw 20 years of .com. You guys started in 89. Next year, you'll be around for 30 years. Which that's like, oh my god! <laughs> yeah, I uh, you know I almost was gonna bring that up a little bit. Um, I guess we'll get there. But I mean, I kind of wanted to focus, and just for those who don't know how this happened, because it's a very interesting story. I think just in in and of itself. Uh, about a two weeks ago now, I got to talk with uh, Jason Bold was here on tour with Bullet for My Valentine, and something I thought would be fun was to bring up Pitch Shifter because I imagine any of the interviews that he's doing out here in the states, that's probably not going to be anything anyone talks about. But uh, you guys ended up sharing it on the on the socials as you were just talking about, and I was like, man, I would love to have anybody come on and talk about it with the shows coming up and you know, twenty years of a, a pretty classic record, and here we are. Um, so I kind of wanted to, to talk, you know, about pitchshifter.com, which it's kind of weird. And, you know, in thinking about it and, and, and kind of prepping for this interview, uh, I think I had mentioned the record on the chat with Jason and I had to clarify for people who may be listening that are bullet fans. It's like, by the way, I'm talking about a record, not 20 years of a website, uh, which would be kind of weird. Right. Um, I mean, that's, that is kind of a weird thing because I mean, in 98 websites weren't really the thing like they are now. So, I mean, what made you guys choose to title the album pitch Um, I, I'm not sure if anyone had done it at the time. We actually had the website night seven because we're writing the album in night seven. And I, I bought that domain, which buying a domain back then was like this act of Congress. It wasn't easy. <laughs> like it's made, you don't just go and click a dollar 99 and go, get, go daddy. Now it was all manual and it was a total nightmare. And I just thought, you know, we're spending all this, time a band spend all this time trying to project this image of themselves and i'm like why not just make the record about the band and our communication method of getting to people is going to be this website let's just call the album about the website and it was i don't know how much your listeners know about pitch shifter probably nothing but um we were pretty experimental for the time definitely 
and and we were just kind of mixing all of these influences drum and bass hip hop techno uh metal hardcore punk we just kind of what everybody liked we threw it all in and it really kind of fitted with the vibe of the band like most people are like what the holy hell is this some people are like this is the dumbest idea ever and then other people are like ah oh, it's genius i wish i'd have thought of that no pun intended <laughs> What I find interesting about it, you know, and remembering when Pitch Shifter, because, you know, the the mid to late 90s were a very interesting time, you know, being a music fan, you know, the internet being in its infancy. I remember when eBay first came out, and one of the things that I enjoyed about it was the fact that I could start getting music that I had heard about, like, you know, like maybe uh, you weren't on a, on a big enough label to, to be, you know, distributed here in America, but... but through eBay right. now, they close the gap a little bit to where if you had the money that you were willing to spend on the shipping and, you know, someone's outrageous price on a CD that maybe cost them $5, you now suddenly were able to bridge that gap and, and be able to find new music that you weren't able to before. And I think the thing that was interesting about Pitch Shifter, especially, you know, like you just said, was how just a, a melting pot of styles it was. And I think that was really indicative of that, that era of music. It's just very interesting to think of how many genres were kind of swirling together to create this own thing. And then it's like, you know, I remember, uh, I think it was in infotainment uh, had come out and my friend was like, dude, have you heard this, this band pitch shifter? And I was like, no, uh, what is it? And he goes, uh, I don't know how to explain it to you. I think you just kind of need to listen to it and see what you think. And I remember just kind of being like, I don't, know how like there's some elements that i do like what you know the punk rock and the and the, the odd time signature kind of things going on but i wasn't big on drum and bass and i hadn't really heard a lot of music incorporating electronic music the way you guys were and so it kind of challenged me as a listener to be like well can i can i take the things that you are presenting me that i do like and mixing it with new things that i, I don't know about and make it palatable to a way to where I want to I want to maybe learn more about where you guys are coming from and, and where these influencers are coming from and that kind of I feel like your scene for lack of a better word from my perspective was very much that it was a very experimental time frame over in the the European music scene and the in sort of the industrial stuff and the metal and so forth can you kind of give me a little bit of a background on that because obviously I didn't live where you guys were and I don't know what your influences really were so I mean, can we can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, to to give it you my perspective, like you know, every our favorite thing to say on the road, pitch shifter, is you know, if something doesn't go right, you'll often hear one of us go, "Do you people have any concept of who I think I used to be?" Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're just you know, we're just not those kind of people. But we didn't fit in. I mean, we were put on death metal bills. When when Kerrang! magazine first featured us in the Prodigy and stuff, Morat, the the uh, the interviewer, he would get death threats. Oh wow! Like, why is this crap in this death metal in this heavy metal magazine? Get this, you know, get this crap out of there. So we would play with Obituary and Carcass and all these full on metal bands because we just did not fit in, and promoters were clueless. I remember the first time we played a oh god, we played with Napalm Death in like Wrexham Memorial Hall in Wales, like a hundred million years ago. And the promoters came to me and said, can we see it? And I'm like, can you see what? And they're like, the drum machine. <laughs> because, because drum machines were like so new technology then to, right. to an old person. They thought it was like a machine that went on a drum kit. Oh, okay. Like, like, a, like, a, like a mechanical, like animatronics device that actually hit skins. And like, I'm, I show them this SR-16, which is a box like as big as two packs of cigarettes. And they're like, that's it? I'm like, yeah, yeah that's it. You do it. You do it. The program and they were just super disappointed. So even though there was this kind of scene, even in that scene, we were kind of like the odd duck. We, they put us on the bill with Fagazi and all the Fagazi fans would say, there are moving lights and samples. This is not for guys. And then they put us on the bill of the death metal bands. And, you know, we weren't going, this is going on. And uh, yeah, those bands are looking and saying, what the holy hell is going on? So I think we started off in that vein. We started off really heavy. 
and I just reached the limit of it. I just said to the band, you know, I can't do this grunting death stuff anymore. It's fun, but it's killing my voice. And you reach this creative limit to it. You know, it's, you can only go so far with it because you can't do a nice ballad. <laughs> <laughs> on top of it. <laughs> not that we're a big ballad band but so we just kind of once we had that discussion where i said look i'm not doing it this way anymore let's just you know take the gloves off and just go for it and then everyone was my brother was like well you know i'm kind of more into the punk and metal stuff and johnny was like well i'm really into the techno stuff and i was like well i'm really more into the hip-hop and drum and bass and but i'm you know one of my big influences is jello biafra Okay. In the lyrics so we just like ah, let's just go for it we just kind of threw all that stuff in there mix that in with uh we were we were on earache at the time with concrete socks johnny morrow of iron monkey was still alive he and i used to get drunk and uh take 50p coins which are like these massive silver dollar coins in england when we throw them at earache's windows at night <laughs> to break the windows after he came back so and then there were just a giant mishmash of bands and influences. We were really into reading books, all the Beat Generation, Carlos Castaneda, William Burroughs, Hunter S. Thompson. We were really into effed up movies like Videodrome. You know, the first Matrix blew my mind. What was that, 97 maybe? Yeah. Um, we just kind of heaped all that in together when we decided that we were going to take the gloves off and we just kind of went for it. There weren't really any other bands that you could say, I've got this perfect bill it's pitch shifter and 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 <laughs> yeah. it would always be these kooky things like quicksand pitch shifter and the death tones or you know girls against boys pitch shifter and carcass it would these you'd see these insane bills you look at them now and you're like what the hell were the promoters thinking but there wasn't really a spot that made sense so we were just like the oddballs that just came on and we were always pretty shy about it i gotta say because we were just like oh my god nobody gets it <laughs> until until we did Ozfest in 2000 mm -hmm. and then when we did Ozfest in 2000 the American bands just did not give a fuck they just came on and they were like 100% energy we're just going to do this and I, I remember chatting backstage to Chris who went on to be in the Foo Fighters no, no use for a name yeah and he's you know we had this conversation backstage once and he's like man it's like prize fighting you get this one thirty minutes to show people what you've got and you just got to go for it in that 30 minutes and before that i think we had this pretty english attitude where we're like oh you know music will win out and then we came off that tour and, and i just you know we would just say we got to go for it so i would i would literally walk straight out on stage and go good evening everybody fuck off <laughs> and the crowd would just look at it and be like what well, and i'd be like oh, sorry did i start i said fuck you guys you know, and i just we just we're from england fuck off you know we just go for it so then when we came back to england we still had that energy and the english crowd was like what the holy hell is this it was kind of like the sex pistols had been reborn you know we just came back and we were just tearing it up and that's why you looking back now you see all these interview uh, pieces where it's like pitch shift the craziest life band ever you know smashing up a piano with with a sledgehammer and throwing out pieces of paper and diving off the balcony and you know so i think that i think influence wise england did have a lot to do with it and but i think performance wise america had a lot to do with it i mean it's pretty sad that an english band has to go to america to get funding and get support but that's always been the english way we have these plucky tries like the guy what's the guy who's the ski jumper oh uh... that's the english way like oh but you're almost quite there but you know you're tiger tim or all these people in tennis that, that's our thing so I, you know we kind of straddled both we, we toured in 30 countries we took influences from all those tours some of the tours we did were massive shows like cosfest and walk tour and then other ones we played a squat to one heroin addict and his dog that was asleep in in switzerland <laughs> and got beaten up at the end you know what uh you know you you talk about an Ozfest and you know Warp Tour just you know called it as far as a cross country tour called it a day. Um, it's funny because when you say I you know where do you put us with any band and I totally agree with that but I think that's kind of the beauty of you guys and something as someone who goes to a lot of shows and used to book shows it's like I like things that aren't the same. I mean if I can get. A perfect bill for me would be like, give me a death metal band, an indie band, a hip hop artist, and something in between. I think that'd be great because right. I don't know what I'm getting at any given point, and nothing is like the thing before it. But maybe there's there actually is some weird thread that ties it all together. You just have to be an active participant 
between everything to kind of figure that out. And I think, you know, with you guys, you know, I think a band like the Deftones is probably a great band to put you with because when you get to hear like, man, Pitch Shift is fucking crazy live. It's like, well, it's crazy on a record. So I can only imagine what it's like live. Like, and you didn't have YouTube to sit there and, and look what a show of yours would have been like. So it's like, right. I feel like for me, I lost out on the ability to see a lot of bands in the short window, especially these, these, Bands like yourself that were touring from overseas where there was a finite window to see you. And, you know, listen, like I said, listening back to, you know, the last few Pitch Shifter records, you know, from that I remember listening to, especially uh, PitchShifter.com, it just kind of took me back to, like I said, and was starting to say, where it takes me back to a time where everyone was just so unafraid to be who they were musically. And I feel like that's something that's, I don't know as me 20 years later if it's like, man, it was such a great era because it was the era that I was coming up in. But I feel like there was just this this sense of not giving a fuck and wanting to be original. And I feel like that's not happening now. There are a few bands in a few different pockets of genres that are doing their own thing. But I don't think far and wide you're seeing bands like if you pull any of those Ozfests up, like a lot of like a lot of bands were just fucking crazy and weird. Like you had a band like System of a Down or you know, Darwin's Waiting Room or even, you know, I guess like you guys or a lot of these bands. And it's like everyone was just going off in their own way and kind of pulling metal as far as that word would allow you to go into these crazy things. And I, I just, I don't know, it's very surreal well, to see that. And I don't know if it was that way from, from your perspective either. I mean, I think it's it, it's relative to where your focus is, right? Pitch Shifter's focus was not on making money. If our focus was on making money, we'd be doing loads of big fluffy ballads like Incubus, <laughs> right? Because well, that's where the money is, or super produced three-minute songs that go intro, verse one, chorus one, half length, verse two, to get you quicker to chorus two, bridge, double chorus three, out. You know, that's the formula of all time since Elvis and Al, but that wasn't our focus. Our focus was just... Not, and we're working class, we're punk kids, you know, we come from working class families, like neither my, neither, I'm the first class, I'm the first time graduate, and first time immigrant, like neither of our parents went to college, nor anyone in the band, we were, you know, we came from dirt, and so it wasn't like, oh, we had this art house band that all went to the Berkeley College of Music and decided to do this experiment. <laughs> we were just, we were just punk kids, like scraping together enough money to buy a pack of cigarettes. And I, Mark and I lived together in the same room for years. Like I slept on the floor some days, he'd sleep on the floor the other day. <laughs> so music was a way for our kind of way out. But, you know, if we'd have wanted to make money out of it, then we would have taken a totally different path. I think you're right that we were just saying we, it, we couldn't hold it in. And, I, and I, we weren't so musically adept that we could say, okay, here are the myriad styles of music available to us as Mozart, and we choose this path. It would just come out like that. You know, we'd sit down behind a keyboard and like genius, you just hear the, you'd find this patch and meow, 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 meow. like, yeah, let's do that. And they'd build on top of it. So it was super experimental, but it was super fun too. Something, you know, one of my friends at work uh, actually today was just selling a, an old drum machine. Um, and we were, he bought a newer one recently and was like, oh, this, I mean, this is a cool one, but this one's way better, has all these other features and stuff. And what was kind of interesting in talking to him about gear like that, because that's not really my realm, like he's more does it for DJing stuff. But it's been interesting to think of, you know, in the mid 90s, like, I can't imagine, you know, samplers and gear like that was cheap. Because I mean, it seemed, I feel like it was kind of a newer piece of technology at the time. Ha! Well, not only was it not cheap, it was crap. <laughs> That's so kind of where I was going to. The dot com album was done on an Atari five twenty ST with a green screen CRT monitor using Logic, uh, using Cubase version one. Okay. <laughs> and we had two Akai S one thousand samplers because you nowadays you have a sample, and you can pick any point in that sample to start the playback. In the old days, if you changed the start point of a sample, you had to create a new sample, Ugh. and the Akai S one thousand had a limited memory. So you had to have two of them to have enough memory and everything was manual. This little page with loads of dots on and you basically just draw the dots and that's where the sounds would come out. I mean, looking back on it now, it's literally like 
you know, writing a master's thesis on a stylophone. <laughs> it's, you know, because some of these some of these songs were 124 tracks when we got to the studio because we were assigning each sample its own track. So right. 124 sounds going simultaneously, and it's on a green screen with basically a little games computer at Atari 520. <laughs> it was pretty insane. Well, that was kind of that's actually more to my point is it's like trying to figure out how to record it would have been I feel like just kind of a a nightmare because like a, like you just basically alluded to uh, the technology really wasn't there and something that was interesting too and and it's funny looking back now seeing producers that I've come to know for working on classic albums over the years I somehow didn't notice that Machine had produced this record because at the time he didn't right. have the name like he does now um, right so. I feel like you worked with Machine relatively at the beginning of his career, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. And definitely one of the first bands that probably would have used a lot of electronics. So what was it like working with Machine back then on this record? I mean, I, I think 16-bit had only just kind of come around then. It was like new stuff. So um, we were just relieved, really. We were, we were relieved to found someone that was as stupid as we were about <laughs> here and experimenting with stuff. And he was like, yeah, let's totally do it. You know, and there's a lot of things in the album that you really won't hear unless you put headphones on. Like um, in some of the second verses, I'm almost singing uh, as if I'm deaf, as a backing sing. I'm not pronouncing any of the consonants. I'm deliberately singing where I'm eating all the words as a buried backing vocal way back. So we ex and whispering and we just experimented with everything all the time. So there's stuff in there that just gives you a feeling. You don't, you don't even actually listen to it, but it just gets this sense of, wow, that second verse sounds a bit weirder than the first one vocally. It's because there's nine layers of it goofing around in the background. Let's try one like this. Let's try one with your mouth full of water. Let's try... You know, let's try reamping the guitar. Let's make the guitar really distorted and then stick it through a cab and put a, a mic on it and then re distort that one and then just keep going until it just sounds like shit. <laughs> well, that's like, there was uh, a song on the Pitch Shifter record. It sounded, and it was funny because when you have uh, free samples, <laughs> right. uh, yeah that's a great song very catchy chorus <laughs> but well the thing was though is when that song came through and i heard the the effect that i was trying to figure out what it was i was like oh well obviously it's water dripping or being poured or whatever but in the song i think two or three songs before it where it is on the record where it's being used in the song i it yeah, I mean, sounded like it sounded like you were dro like almost dropping water on a guitar running through effects and creating this weird hybrid of you know its own kind of sample or a loop and i was like the fuck did they do that and like i was you know trying to think like my 2018 brain trying to go back and be like okay like how would you have done that in 1998 with even right. more limited things because you know something that i remember i think it was on the sound city documentary uh, you know, where they were talking about when everyone's everything started to kind of go to digital, but they were talking about how long the process was to get a mix. Like, it'd be like, okay, and now let it do its thing to, to be able to, the, like, change that one section, go back and listen to everything. And they'd be like, yeah, it'd take like three hours. So I was just yep. thinking to myself, it's like, okay, like, if you were doing this and then running this and all that, it's like, for it to be played back to know that you got the effect that you wanted, I was like, God, that would... <laughs> just be so painstakingly long to figure out if you got the effect the way you wanted it to, to mix it down into the song to then hear the playback. And so yeah, no, and nothing was robust. Stuff would crash. You know, <laughs> you've, you've got 124 <laughs> tracks running yeah. on an Atari 520ST and it just goes, you know, in the middle of the recording, you're like, oh God. And then it's reboot that system and then reboot machine system, you know, so 35 minutes later when all the super loud raid drives in another room had come back to life. What was the mixing process like for that record? We mix in the booth. So okay. uh, we don't do... I, I, it always makes me laugh when you see these videos and it's like Metallica and they're all standing in the room. And it's <laughs> one, one take in the, in the live room where it's all like a thousand dB. And it's like, that's it. Thumbs up through the thing. You got it, buddy. It's like, that's... I mean, that's not my experience. That may be theirs, but I just think that's BS. So we have always played in the mixing room. So you just get a super long guitar cable and you sit in the big comfy couch or you stand up and run around in the mixing room and you play in the mixing room. You do, you, so you do bass and guitar in the mixing room. The only thing we don't is drums and vocals because obviously you need that booth environment. Right. So um, 
we'd always mixed our own music because you couldn't go into if you took your Atari 520 ST to someone and said mix this from a regular recording studio, they'd just look at you and go, "What the holy hell are you talking about? <laughs> Where is the tape machine? How does it all work?" They're just like, "No." So we'd always mixed ourselves. So Machine was very gracious in allowing us to be super involved in the mixing process because I would say, no, I want that louder. This is a feature. He was good at crafting. He was good at the big picture, the orchestration and crafting the sounds and making them sound a bit more organic because we were a bit digital, obviously. But he really was gracious in letting us say, well, actually, this guitar here is a focus. It needs to rise up. And sometimes he'd say, oh, have you thought about singing an extra verse or doing this or that? It would be great. So He's a, he was a really hands-on producer, and it was a lot of fun to mix that record. A lot of crappy stuff happened during that record, though. Uh, one of our friends died. Um, uh, just before I was about to start doing vocals, one of our friends back home had died that I had worked with. And that was pretty – so I took a week off, and then we were just about to start to do vocals again, and then my dog died. Uh, I got the call from England like, oh, sorry, dude, your dog's died. I'm like, what? So it's like I could never just – every time I got to the vocal booth, it was just some – freaking horror so i just you know i i ironically fortuitously had a bit bit of extra time to kick the songs around in my head because i you know i just, I just hey do guitars first do this first like i need a break so uh but it was super fun mixing that record I, I, and i remember there were loads of technology bloops and bleeps because i remember i remember it must be pretty close to when 16-bit systems were actually legitimately available and it just seemed to you know and but you're still running through analog cables. You're mm -hmm. like, oh, fiber optic. So it was just reams and reams. Like you'd look at the back and it was just like 150 phono cables of this cable just <laughs> subcable going, coming out the back. I mean, you know, it was like the mad 1.21 gigawatts. What was I thinking? You know, people would look at the back and like, I have no concept of what any of you are doing. And how can this possibly work? You know, because people were used to going to the studio and just setting up their guitar and plugging it in and going, let's go. Even with the guitar, like, nine cabs this one's mic'd up differently that one's going through this unit now of course you can just dial that effect in on your phone yeah <laughs> just go oh oh metallic guitar effect on my phone let's go you know you know something too that kind of thinking back to this era when the the record came out initially you know i was thinking about how far just in general technology has come along as far as what you can do with recording the the tech available to the musicians and more so actually the live setting. And I was reminded of when I saw tool on the lateralis tour and they had Meshuggah at the time opening for them, which uh, blew my fucking mind for all the wrong reasons at first, because it sounded like shit. And <laughs> I realize now it's because eight string guitars weren't, a thing then like they are now sound systems couldn't handle the low frequency of the and and to be completely honest neither could a lot of the gear that the band was actually playing through uh right. because it just that wasn't a thing and it's funny to go back and listen to those records now you know like chaos sphere and so forth and kind of hear how with modern production and with better pickups better strings better guitars that can handle the low intonation and so forth and now PA systems that can handle all of that stuff as well. Seeing how amazing that band can sound, even playing those older songs. And it made me think, as I was listening to the records today, what kind of issues did you guys run into in a live setting, having to deal with you know, venues and PA systems maybe not being up to snuff for what you were trying to accomplish in a live setting? We quickly started bringing our own gear. We, so we had a sound guy called Rabbit. All sound men only have one name. We've had sound men called Spock, Rabbit, Shit, Mole. I don't know, it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, our sound man, Rabbit, was awesome at fixing stuff. I cannot tell you how many times we'd be in the middle of a gig in Paris and I'd look over and Rabbit literally had a torch in his mouth and a screwdriver and he's at the side of the PA fixing something that we'd blown up for the fight <laughs> this time. So we quickly migrated to bringing our own gear. As the band got bigger, we started bringing uh, PA with us. So, you know, we, we're Barra boys, right? We were selling you newspaper in North London for a couple of shekels, you know, working class family. So I'd get this tour, 20 shows, and I'd say, I'd call up every venue and go, how much are you going to charge me for the PA? And they'd be like, I'll charge you a grand, you know. So then I'd have 20 shows, 20 grand. So then I'd call the local PA company and go, if you can tour with these 
eight racks of MT4 sub, which would blow everyone's face off, and bring your own bring your own guys and blah 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 for anything less than twenty grand, I'll give it to you. And they'd be like, deal. So we'd be playing these smaller venues and we'd show up with these huge freaking stacks of sub bass. And people would be like, what's all this? Oh, we like, don't worry about it. And one of the things we've always done in Pitch Shifter is every chorus below Mark's bass is a sub bass playing the same notes. So if the bass guitar line's going underneath it, 60 hertz and below is a sub going when you marry those two together so there's no gap, it sounds like Mark's playing Satan's bass, Poseidon's scepter from the deep. It never comes through unless you've got the sub bass in the PA to make that happen. So people, you know, you're listening to it on your crappy iPhone headphones, it's not going to come through. But you're standing in front of a rack of empty four sub in a venue at, in a 15k PA at 110 decibels. And you're like, why are my teeth rattling when I need to go to the restroom? <laughs> so we would always... Like, that's why I would, I, we would always say if you haven't seen us play live, you haven't seen us because you're not going to get that coming through your little tinny headphones. You would literally, our, our thing with the sound man is I want the kick drum and the bass to feel like it's kicking you in the stomach. And I want every time the snare hits to make people blink, then it's loud enough. And we, well, that's why I think, I think you're right. We were doing stuff that others weren't doing they talk about people then they're like oh yeah we're going to coat the bass with sub they're like what the hell are you talking about I'm like it sounds amazing live you just come on live and it does and when we would play with other bands bigger bands even like metallica we play with them in madrid and everything they'd say you can only go up to eight on the desk and then with pitch shifter because i would say to bands your band a support band can go as loud as they want because it doesn't matter because you don't have any sub in your set because you're playing through normal instruments. When when those samples kick in with the sub, it doesn't matter if we're at exact same level. There's a rack of sub at the front that's going to play that lead <laughs> line. And I guarantee you we're going to sound twice as big. So you just have at it. Turn it up or all the way. If you want. We'll even play quieter than you if it makes you feel bad. You know, the bands were like, oh my God. You know, sport, sport bands are like, oh my God, you mean we can play as loud as you? Like, yeah, man, I like it. <laughs> you know, that's kind of funny. I... Sometimes I love talking about various things I've come to learn from about the music industry over the many years that I've been fascinated with it through documentaries, talking to people, and so forth. I think that the, the I won't call it a volume war, but basically the volume limit that a lot of, when you go on these bigger tours, that bands will put on the opener, so that way, obviously, when the band you pay big money to come see, oh my god, they sound so much better than the openers. And it's like, well, there's a reason. How often... Did that really happen for you guys? Because I feel like, you oh know, like, God. I was gonna, I was All gonna say, time. I was gonna say. I mean, you've kind of already said, you know, like uh, between, you know, not sounding like anybody and a lot of the gear that's different than anybody else is using at the time. I feel like that's another thing that would probably be a strike against you is that you play louder than everyone because you have all these other instruments and tools at your disposal that people aren't using. And I feel like people would probably just be like, man, fuck, this band plays live aggressively. They have all these things we don't use. And, you know, I just feel like people would probably be more apt to be afraid to take you out. Like maybe it would it was almost a detriment to your career at the time of being like so different in all phases of being a band. We, you, that, there's a quote, there's a Hunter S. Thompson quote about the music industry. I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember, but it's like the music industry is a long, dark trench filled with bandits and thieves where good men die like dogs, there's also a dark side. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man, I mean, I, when you're a support band, and we don't do this for any band, by the way. So just to give it context, on this tour, this six-date run, we ran a competition. We gave all the baby band slots away for free because I hated the pay-to-play. And then we just decided to take friends of ours, F09, or Nottingham out. No one's got their set restricted. The drummer from Earth 09 is going to drum for us. The, the front of house sound for Earth 09 is going to do our sound too. It's just like buddies going on the road. We don't restrict song titles, how much merch they can sell. I mean, when you play with a big band, they say you're allowed to have one T-shirt on the merch stand. They've got like 400 T-shirts at a million dollars, and you're only allowed to have one, and you have to sell your shirt at their price. Right. So in terms of the sound thing, yeah, totally. They would... 
they would always say, you can only play at this volume level. I'd look over at our Sandman Rabbit and he'd be giving me thumbs up like, yes, yeah, screw that. I'm going to push it anyway. I remember the funniest one ever was Stained, the band Stained. Oh, yeah. They had a vanity riser, right? So they have this like go in that snash it, slash it snake pit where the singer goes out into the front and we play this big show with them. And we had to meet with their stage manager. And we meet with their stage manager and he goes, you're not allowed to stand anywhere that's got yellow tape on it on the stage. Okay. Like in addition to the t-shirts and in addition to the sound, I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you're not allowed to stand on those areas. So, of course, the very first thing the band, like this first nanosecond of the first song, we'll just run onto those yellow areas. We're all like, that's right. I'm like, screw you. The bass player of Stained actually came up to me and said, I'm sorry, man, that's all BS. And he goes, I'm going to let you know I'm a super big fan of Pitch Shifter. I love Mark's bass sound. <laughs> so it's funny. But yeah, even to the point where like, yep, yeah, nope, don't stand there. Only there. Okay, don't be too energetic. It's kind of like Elvis. Only film them from the waist up. Right. To destroy stuff too much. <laughs> You got to wonder, though, I mean, typically it seems like it's not any of the bands actually doing this. It's it's the egos potentially of the, the people who are also making money from these things. Like, well, if my I don't know. Some my, singers have got I've got LSD. Well, for sure. Disease. For sure. Um, yeah. But it's it, I've always thought the, the whole volume thing and limiting a band like that and, you know, making bands have to. Like you can only have one shirt and you got to sell it at $70 too. And it's like, who the fuck is going to buy the opening band's and t-shirt I, for exactly. $70? Like, what the fuck? I don't well, even want to buy I've, your shirt at $70. <laughs> well, I don't even want I don't want you to give me $70 and your shirt. No, I've been, I've been screwed over by support bands too, you know, cause we have this banter from, from, from years of stuff breaking, you know, mm. we learn how to entertain a crowd when it's just dead silence. You know, I'd get the, the rabbit would come through on my ears and go, yeah, the PA's fucked. Um, it's going to take me about 20 minutes to fix it. Entertain the crowd. <laughs> and the band will turn around. <laughs> you know, my band will turn around and start looking important, tuning things and like fiddling with their heads. And you're just naked. You know, you're naked. You're there with your shirt off in a pair of shorts holding a microphone. And you're like, well, a funny thing happened to me on the way over here, folks. You know, And so we just kind of randomly got into, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. But I just think you are at the show. And everyone should share the same show. All of that vanity nonsense and bands shouldn't happen. It's just about the gig. You should, you should come. You should play. I, I would get screwed up by big, big and big bands and little bands. I remember. I think it was Sona Farik. I'd be playing, and he'd be watching me every night, the singer. And I think, oh, that's nice. We got on well. Nice guy. And then all my usual banter and my shtick was started going down like a lead balloon. <laughs> shows. And I'm thinking, what's going on? So then I decided to watch him play the next night. And he'd, he'd watch me play three times in a row and stolen all of my in-between song talk and was saying it while they were playing. So by the time we came on, it was like old hat, even though we were the headliner. Ah. <laughs> so, so it goes both ways. Like You've got to keep your toes, your wit about you both ways because you, you know, people will try and shaft you any which way they can. So, you know, here we are in 2018. You got a handful of shows uh, scheduled for next month. What was the catalyst uh, for this to happen? I mean, you know, we're not a giant band. We get offers all the time. I would get, I get off, I got an offer yesterday. Will you come and headline this festival in Poland? I can pay you $10 and a pack of smokes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, thanks for the offer. I appreciate it, but no. So we get these offers all the time, and we kind of laugh about them, and Mark and I talk about it, and Dan and Tim and I, we, we all kind of still connect. Even though, you know, I, we all live in different countries and cities, <laughs> so it's kind of digitally. And then it, the, we just kind of, there's been this larger groundswell because people start talking about, hey, it's 20 years since .com, and People back home were talking about it. Are you going to do something? Are you going to see something? They're like, nah, whatever. Maybe, maybe not. And then uh, Rock City, which was kind of like the band's spiritual home, you know, it was the place that we really kind of caught a break and they, they were very kind to us back in the day. And, and this kind of Nottingham's, and one of England's best live venues and the band was originally from Nottingham. So they're like, hey, you want to do a one-off show? And I'm like, well, if you've got the money, and it's pretty expensive for me to fly to LA to 
do one went to do one hour show I'd be like peace okay I'm going home I said uh, you know I'd treat it as a family just to see the family and I'll do it just to break even and blah 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 so so my brother said oh we should probably do a few more leave it with me I'll think about it well six shows later I was like good news I booked six shows back to back <laughs> you're coming over to play I'm like oh my god so uh, Nottingham Rock City, the, the, the people that have run that organization for a long time kind of blossomed into a promotions company called DHP Promotion. And they were like, well, you know, we'll take on and do the whole thing. I've, I've known George who runs that company for 20 years, 20, 25 years now. Mm -hmm. So I felt good about it. I didn't feel, you know, I've, I've literally taken gigs in Italy and played the show. And the promoter has said to me, hey, yeah, I'm sorry, there weren't enough people that came, so I can't pay you the back end. I'm like, well, uh, that was the money I was going to use for the flights home. You know, I don't believe you. There was a lot of people in the crowd, and, and the promoter has reached into his back pocket, taken out his gun, cocked it, put it on the table. Two massive guys have come behind him in the darkened room and said, I don't think you heard what I said. I said there isn't enough money. And we've been like, Okay, it's a pleasure doing business with you gentlemen. So we've been in experiences where we've, you know, we've had guns pulled on us and not been play, paid. And we really are not going to have that kind of experience with my friend George. <laughs> you know I mean? with a reputable company with, in, you know, in, that, in the place that kind of gave birth to the band and the specific venue that gave birth to the band. So we felt really good about that. So when they made the offer, we were like, yeah, we got to do it, you know. And, you know, thankfully for whatever stars have aligned, ticket sales have been really good. I guess there's a lot of crazy bastards still out there <laughs> ready to get pummeled in the pit. I actually just had someone on Twitter found the Jason Bold episode. Uh, I guess he's from here in Grand Rapids, but lives somewhere, some other state. Um, and was like, I bought tickets to one. I don't know if he said all the shows or a couple of the shows, but he was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to see the band ever again. So, like, I'm going. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> Wow. Uh, that's pretty crazy. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and I got to say, no, no hype or sell. I don't know if we'll get to do it again. I mean, we literally haven't played a show for a decade. We've been pretending to be normal citizens so that our children don't get too embarrassed at school. How? I would assume rehearsals probably haven't started just yet. Pitch shifter rehearsals have always been weird, right? Because because we play to samples, it's click. Mm -hmm. So before any tour ever, we all rehearse at home to the CD ostensibly. And then we have one full day together where we iron out the kinks. That's been the same story forever. What, uh, you know, speaking as we have about the technological advances over the years from where you started with everything to now and playing your first shows in over a decade, are you still using some of the original gear that you were using or are you like, oh my god, I, I get to like I have to buy some of this shit again, and kind of being interested to see how far like, oh, this thing used to cost me like three hundred dollars, and it you know I it was only one component of the thing I need. Now I can spend one hundred and eighty dollars and get something that took me three other machines to 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 do. Are are you having like a kid in a, t a candy shop now of getting to rebuy some of this stuff or? So for the, to get the samples to play live, we went through every single kind of setup there was, and we, we eventually landed on a DA38 tapes, which are like Tascam's version of that tapes, because they're bulletproof. You can sync two of them together. If one craps out, you've got two of them synced together. You just flip the button, and it goes to the other one. When we, when we kind of last stopped playing, it, peop, a lot of people were doing laptops. I remember Dub War, or Skin Dread as they are now, they yep. used to do uh, an iPod. <laughs> wrapped in yep. wrapped in wrapped in saran wrap so it wouldn't get damaged by uh moisture Age, yeah but that thing would skip and that was you know sketchy too and then you know people are using uh laptops which crash so we it's funny you say that you know i'm you know when mark said oh yeah we're gonna do our books and like um where is the rack with the two da38 tapes in and seeing as they are tape machines that haven't physically been turned on in a decade I'm pretty sure they're not going to work. Like, what the hell are we going to do? So we always worked in Logic. So I have uh, I found an old hard drive that's got Logic Pro 7 version of the songs that we converted with an old G5 to Logic Pro X 
that will work on a modern machine. And then we've, we've got those in England now and we're converting those from a laptop in Logic to these cement <laughs> uh, hard drive units that are like 500 bucks each that contain 24 tracks that you kind of load the whole song on in a, on the USB stick because they don't move. So that's been like this process of like, how do you get it from A to B? Like, how do you get something out, out of this format into this format? It's like, they don't even make that anymore. Like even my, my old RME Fireface 800 sound card is Firewire 800. You can't physically plug it into anything now. You know, my, all my new laptops are USB-C. Mm -hmm. you, you can't get Firewire 800 to USB-C converter that's worth the crap that will run all that audio. So <laughs> that, was, that was a bit of a journey down <laughs> memory lane on a bit of a kind of hacking, like, okay, we can do this to this, then this to this, then this to this. Yeah, I was, again, as I was listening to everything and, again, thinking about stuff, I was like, I mean, sometimes even just converting from a phone from, like, like an iPhone 5 to an 8 now or an X, it's like, I don't know how the fuck I'm going to do this. Like, I, like, yeah, I guess you could, well, no, because that doesn't have iCloud because iCloud wasn't a thing on it. Like, just even, like, the antiquity, oh, yeah. like, technology just from a phone's perspective of just pre transporting contacts or anything that you had on your phone, it's like, okay, well, it's kind of a clusterfuck now to figure out how to do that, and that's only a few years old. Go back 20 years where shit didn't yeah. exist like it does now, and it's like, okay, well, how do you start the conversion process? Because, yeah, you may have hard drives, but those hard drives may not have inputs that work on anything yeah. now. So it's like, okay, so now what do you do? And yeah. it was just kind of a, a very interesting thought of, like, how do you take something – how do you take music from 20 years ago, upgrade, update it now to where you can use it to recreate what yeah. you were doing and 20 years ago? Our entire catalog's pre-cloud, right? I'm like literally, I found an old G5 in the garage that I fired up and it had, it had that prong remix I did and it had the stuff from the Unfinished 7th album in 2009. None of that stuff was backed up. No. <laughs> 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 It's just sitting in the guy. I turn. I, I found this G5 on. I push the button. Ten years later, on it goes. No crazy. Like, wow. <laughs> what uh? What are you looking forward to the most uh, at these shows? You know, I'm, I'm ambivalent. I have mixed feelings, right? So I I started in the band when I was 18. I did it from 18 to 30. So like the bulk of my then adult life, I was working with my brother, which was awesome, and I didn't have a real job. So I had no concept of what normal life was actually like as soon as we started doing the band. Because we, it was nine, nine months of touring, three months in the studio, nine months of touring, three months in the studio. So we did that for such a long time. It just kind of became second nature. There's a lot of things I love about touring. There's a lot of things I hate about touring. <laughs> because <laughs> I've been to 30 different countries on earth. And that you know people are like, oh, why are you complaining about that? But traveling, after a while, when you do that much traveling, traveling zero fun. You're just constantly jet lagged, and if you're six, I'm six foot two, two hundred pounds. So you're just constantly crunched into these little spaces, breaking your spine. Like I wish I could just sleep. If someone could just inject sleep drugs into my eyes, just do it now. Just let me sleep. <laughs> I think looking forward to. I'm looking forward to my kids seeing it. I think you know they've seen they've seen some videos online and this and that, but I think when they see it live, they're like, holy crap! You know, and they see the. 1,500 people going nuts at Nottingham Rock City from the safety of the balcony. They'll just be like, dear God, what is this? Funny thing about the kids is they all like Dan TDM and Dennis Daly and all these huge stars. So every one of their stars has got like 26, every one of their like heroes has got 26 million followers and every video they make has a million views. So they're like, dad, dad, like come here. I'm like, your genius video only has 600,000 hits. What went wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Like, what went wrong? Like, nothing, kid. The, the, the world was different then. So I think I'm really looking forward to just catching up with everyone. We have these rabid fans, like Dave the super fan. There's a guy from England, Dave Weston, every show, tattoo, named his kid after us. His kids could not call Pitch Shifter, but his middle name's Clayton, you know. Right. I'm looking forward to seeing those people. I'm, I'm scared to see the crowd. I don't know what everyone's going to look like now that we're all, we're all pushing 50. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What, you know, do they look like 
a friend of mine went to a heavy metal festival recently that was all people our age and he, he said i said what was it like you know because i've been kind of in a i've been on my cryo chamber in the remote island of Anche to for decades not really being involved in it and he said, you know, it was kind of like a band of drunken orcs trying to kill each other. Like, <laughs> like grizzly. It was like, everyone was grizzly. Everyone was overweight. Everyone slept their piercings and their tattoos and all bled and gone blue. It was really like the birth of the uh, crushed species by the orcs in uh, Lord of the Rings. Like, oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> so I have no idea what to expect. I think that'll be fun. I'm really looking forward to seeing Earth Tone Nine because uh, I love them. Carl actually moved to Detroit this okay. year, so he and I will both be kind of winging our way back. I'm really looking forward to the Blueprint reforming just for the Nottingham show. So you've got three Nottingham bands playing a Nottingham venue that they played together a decade ago. I find these old photos of Carl and me as super young kids drinking backstage at the garage in London. I'm like, look at this one. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the things I'm not looking forward to are the crazy people. You know, I cut your name in my arm. It's still freshly bleeding. You want to take a photo? Uh, not so much. Thank you. Um, you know, um, and you know, the waiting around. I think it was the other Rolling Stones that said, I've seen some of the best parking lots in the, in the world. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I, I'm just... I read an interview with the cult years ago where they were like, oh, I've got missing teeth and I'm 40 and I just want to connect with people and I kind of laughed at it. But I think that kind of is what it is about now. I, we don't need to prove anything. We're certainly not going to get rich from doing this tour. <laughs> and, I, you know, there's no new album to promote. We're not answering any negative call. I just think it felt right that we give it one last kick around the old mulberry bush before we crumble to dust and i think it's just about connecting with people that that have a connection with the music and seeing people after all this time musicians are weird you know you can not you can literally not see someone or speak a word to them in 10 years and you're in the same room and it's just straight back where you were hey man remember that time and it's there aren't many fields where there's that much camaraderie Right between between musicians. I mean, you know, record labels and publishers can be evil, of course, but musicians <laughs> themselves. You know, it's it's a pretty cool scene to be in. So I'm kind of looking forward to it. I'm kind of terrified. I'm older. You know, we've some of us have survived cancer. Some of us have survived divorce. Some of us have been in car accidents, freaking ups and downs. You know, it's been a long time since we were on on stage and and together, but we're all still kicking somehow. Nuclear cockroaches cannot be killed. <laughs> um, kind of my last few questions for you. Um, obviously, gearing up for the tour, you, you've probably been doing the homework, like you said, uh, listening back to the records, kind of gearing up for rehearsals. How do you feel the the catalog has aged over the last twenty years? You know, I was thinking about this. Some songs I freaking hate. Just because they're so repetitive. Like back then, the repetition was part of it because bands weren't doing that. The fact right. that you do the repetition, like the genius for the same lyrics thing again, it was like, people are like, oh, it's so annoying. I'm like, I know, that's the point, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, some of, some of it I just do, I don't enjoy. Other, I think I'm as a wax-mustached Renaissance man, polymath, I like the classics, right? So... I think Genius, Please Sir, Microwave, a lot of the tunes from the dot com album, just they're just punk metal with some other influences. And, you know, like I say, I was super inspired by Jello Bafra for the lyrics. So I think that kind of vitriol with Trump and Brexit and all that stuff, it's still kind of relevant. Some of the other songs, and other songs, you know, uh, Eight Days is still a kick and chin. That, that song we wrote, I think we wrote at the airport. Oh, wow. We, we were waiting to go and record, and Jim had a little acoustic guitar, and I was like, what about this? I think that was actually inspired by Beetle Bum by uh, Blur. Oh, okay. We, that, that was kind of around at the time, and it was like, we could do something similar to that, but ridiculously heavy and sound like us. <laughs> so I, I think some of them have fared better than others. I can't listen to the super grunty early stuff. It just pains me. <laughs> I do, and that's no I know fans, there are fans of like one, Fans that like pitch shifter, two words, and fans right. that like pitch shifter, one word, and fans that like both. But for me, I just, 
the grunty stuff, I'm just like, oh god, because I guess I was I was 18 when we did that. I just remember being 18, spotty and awkward. You know, a lot of bands when they do these reunion shows, knowing potentially it could be the last, knowing that there are fans all over the world that wish they could attend these shows, but maybe just financial constraints just aren't able to. Is there plans to film any of this uh, at all for something? Yeah, we're currently planning on filming one of the London shows okay. just because uh, none of us actually live in Nottingham anymore. Okay. None of us actually live in London anymore. <laughs> but <laughs> that's kind of where we've got the, the biggest kind of friend space. So it's easier for us with that network to get London film. We'll try, we'll, I'll, I'll make sure that we desk record audio, all of the songs. So I'll try and make those available. But um, we're going to try and film London. Okay. And, and the Garage Club, you know, I'm, I was born at home in Highbury. My mum was hardcore. She goes to the hospital and she goes, yeah, I didn't like that. So I decided to give birth to your brother and you at home. <laughs> so we were physically born in Highbury, which is, and the garage is in, is in Highbury Corner in London. So, I mean, it's super close to us. I, we played it with, I mean, there's, I think Carl, I think Earth Tone 9 and Pitch Shifter played the garage like 19 years ago. There's photos of it. So, and now, and then DHP, who are the parent company of Rock City, same people, they bought the garage, which is my friend George. So it's like this crazy family tie connection. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just crazy. So I think that show is going to be. Uh, we played there once and I did a solo. <laughs> so, I don't know where we get these ideas, but I did a solo uh, with a sledgehammer and a piano. So. We, <laughs> We wheel this. We wheel this piano out, and everyone thinks, "Oh, he's going to tinkle the Irish." And then I just take this sledgehammer and just smash it to pieces. But unbeknownst to me, because I'm not that great of a musician, uh, piano's got a giant harp in the middle that's <laughs> steel. So I hit once. I hit that with the sledgehammer. It was like the cartoon Wiley Coyote. My body's vibrating. It's like, what have I done? <laughs> but um, so there's a lot of memories at the garage. I think that'll be a good show to finish. It's a pretty small show. It's like. 500 it's like 600 capacity it's gonna oh, be wow. it's already the, the first one's already oversold Shh, don't tell fire marshals by like 10 so it's gonna be it's gonna madness. be awesome <laughs> yeah in there no so anyway uh kind of wrap this up since that happened um no i was gonna say you know a lot of people get back together magic in the room and all that kind of stuff uh so i don't know if in preparation for these shows if there has been talks of writing a new song for for these six shows uh or if you even anticipate maybe something like that happening or if there's even been talks of like you know let's just write something and and be a studio only band at this point and whatever capacity that looks like just putting out songs whenever they're done or whatever what is the future for pitch shifter from these shows going forward you know that's a great question we you know i found the unreleased seventh album demos right so there are there are a good number like seven instrumental demos of songs that we never finished um there's one of those ad vocals on and i threw that out apply yourself um so that that unreleased album is called sprint finish and then uh and then a little bit of irony yeah and then uh one of the demos that does have vocals on that I recently put out on Bandcamp and uh, iTunes and all that stuff is called Apply Yourself. So there is the vague possibility that something could happen to those additional songs, right? If, uh, if we ever decided to finish them, if, we're, if we ever decided to do anything with it, I cannot envision that would be like good news everyone <laughs> we're gonna go back on the road and back in the studio and you know this thing's starting up again we're all uh, like i say a little bit older now uh we've got families we've got pretend assumed identities in the witness protection program <laughs> and so uh i can't see that translation to like picture if you're fully back i you know i don't discount maybe doing something you know, I, I, one of the fans was like, but so I found this acoustic demo of Stop Talking So Loud, and I threw that out on Bandcamp. And a lot of fans were like, I freaking love this. Why don't you do an acoustic, just re-sing all of the main songs in acoustic? Which, because, you know, I think that's 
some of the times that's how we used to write songs, like, you know, eight days. It was just Jim and I and an acoustic guitar in an airport, I seem to remember, and we just jammed it out. So that's not really a side of pitch shifter that people know or understand. They're just like, no, that's... I, I, I did a poll on the social media. I got the social media people to do a poll and said, we found an acoustic demo of a song. Do you want to hear it or do you not want to hear it? And it was... some Quite a lot of people said, no, dear God, no, don't ruin my memory of pitch shifter. So... That's just the kind of envelope pushing thing that I think would actually be fun. Like not to like, oh, can I make an album that's even heavier than all the heavy albums that we've made or even punker, but can you translate some of those songs into just one dude and an acoustic guitar? That actually kind of feels like, so I don't know, you know, we might do something kooky like that. Actually, listening to that un- unfinished, I'm really seventh album, there's some good stuff on there. That one song, Apply Yourself. That's a good song. Like my kids have been singing it. I've been playing it to them in the car. I'm like, Dad, what's this song called? Like, it's called Apply Yourself. They're like, yeah. <laughs> so my little kids have been headbanging in the car. So you never know what might happen. There aren't any plans. Like I say, I don't think we've got anything to prove. And I don't. I think creativity is just something that comes to you when it comes. It comes. And if you push it, it's crap. Right. <laughs> so I think we're at a point in our lives where we're like we did what we needed to do and this tour is just about kind of connecting with people now that people have good memories in their lifetime of what we've done and with the political situation being, situation being so effed, a lot of those lyrics still seem to ring true. But to answer your question, no, I don't have any plans for any additional tours. You know, if someone said, of course, if someone said, hey, you want to come and headline this festival for, for loads of money and we'll make it super painless for you. I'm like, sure. You know, but schlepping around in a in a van for a few ciders it's not, necessarily, it's not necessarily where we're at this ripe old age of maturity um so where can people find you and or the band uh online you cannot find us at pitchshifter.com which i know is the ultimate irony it i held on to that domain for many 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 years and it it felt like something I needed to do. Like I needed to fail at a test. I needed to just let it go. I needed to release it into the wild. And people were like, why the hell would you ever do that? It's kind of like Banksy shredding yeah. his painting. It's something that I needed to do. I needed to, I think Mark and I both needed to say, this does not define us. We can let this go and still be people in the world. <laughs> so I let it, so I let pitchshifter.com go, which sounds ridiculous, but it was super liberating. Like letting like now, a piece of you go. Yeah, now it's like some crazy site in Japanese about kids' vitamins or something. Oh, boy, <laughs> which I think is super punk and highly amusing. But you can find us, you know, because we are Generation X, there are a lot of our fans on Facebook. I'm personally not on Facebook, but there is a Pitch Shifter page on Facebook that you can find. Uh, there's also an Instagram. That's Pitch Shifter UK. Instagram and then there's pitch shifter on Twitter. That's about it. We're not we're not doing any freaking video blogs and meet the family crap. You know, we post stuff that people ask us for. I might do a live chat on Facebook before the tour. People have been asking for that. That'd be cool. That's about the size of it. And then there's Bandcamp. Uh, I think that's pitch shifter UK too. We've been just chucking releases on there, and then you know you can get some stuff on iTunes and Apple Play and blah blah. And uh, I always like to end these episodes out to a song. So what would you like me to play it out to? Oh, man. Wait. Uh, one of mine or any song in the world? As long as I can find it on YouTube or somewhere online. That's all my, my caveat that I usually have. I think you've got, you got to go out with Please Sir. Okay. By Pitch Shifter. Any version. Live. Whatever you want. That's kind of my. That's the song I've got, I'm most kind of proud of the lyrics and the the fact that it's just a giant punk mashup of silliness. And uh, fans can see you guys uh, starting November nineteenth out in Portsmouth. Is it Portsmouth or am I putting the American accent on that? <laughs> it's Portsmouth. Okay, yeah. okay. Some because you know, growing up in the East Coast originally, living here in the Midwest, and trying to pronounce something that's not from the u.s it's like okay am i americanizing this or putting the wrong accent yeah. on it but just making sure i got it right uh, I, love yeah. it. Yeah, I love it when americans do that it's complete bollocks no it's bollocks <laughs> <laughs> uh 
Yeah. So November 19th, the band's uh, starting their six-date run out in Portsmouth and ending on November 24th in Nottingham uh, with Earth Tone 9. And as you heard, maybe some live uh, footage will be surfacing after the shows, and maybe who knows what else the future holds for Pitch Shifter from 2018 and beyond. But uh, John, thank you so much for taking the time and talking all things PitchShifter.com and this live show's coming up. Uh, greatly, greatly appreciated it. Thank you, man. I appreciate the time. Peace and love to everyone out there. I hope to see someone at the shows. So that was my conversation with John Clayton of Pitch Shifter. Another nice, long interview there. Dan, what did you think of that since you sadly, again, couldn't be there? Yeah, um, I was just, you know, just listening to it and getting more and more angry because you skipped all these amazing questions that I would ask had I been there. But no, in all seriousness, I uh, I thought it was a good chat, man. And I, I liked that it was a good long one, you know, especially for somebody that, you know, maybe you weren't already friends with prior to doing the interview um i thought it was a really nice chat and very chill and those are my favorite kind long form and uh i really just learned a lot about pitch shift from that that i didn't know and i honestly really am excited about this kind of comeback you know like more so than i was before like before it was just something you read about but when you hear the artists themselves kind of talk about it it's kind of a it makes it more real i guess yeah i toward the end there I was a little trepidatious in asking if there was maybe a new song the band was working on. Because, I mean, how often do you see, like, these these reunion shows and all of a sudden it's like, new song, new whatever band's name song on YouTube or all over the music sites and so forth. And it definitely just made me kind of be like, all right, I mean, a lot of your stuff is, you know, done through tracks that, you know, you, you don't have to get in a room necessarily to do stuff with them so it would seem like it'd be a lot easier for those guys to be like i got this idea rolling around and start doing some other stuff and the next thing you know it's like you know basically like you said and then when he was like well actually i found this hard drive and it has like the whole seventh record that no one has heard and i was just like what there's a whole record that like no one knows was done put it out (laughs) yeah i mean it sounds like basically it just other than maybe being like actually recorded you know, real instrumentation and all that. It sounds like other than vocals, the songs themselves are done. Yeah. He made it sound like he basically had a zip file with a whole album on it. (laughs) Like, I mean, I'd love to hear that, especially from being, you know, so old, you know? (laughs) Yeah. It It, uh... it sounds, it sounds weird, but like, it's just weird to me that like, I've got this stack of hard drive. Like I'm looking at a stack of hard drives right now in my basement and there's not a whole album on any of them, you know. <laughs> At least not one that I recorded. You know, I'm sure there's some old. Uh, I'm sure there's some old uh, Kazaa or LimeWire stuff on there, but yeah. Yeah, it's totally. I don't know. I think that's the the fun thing about getting to talk to some of these bands who are coming back. Like, I mean, Finch basically came back, you know, with a record. And the cool thing, if you can say a cool thing about a band breaking up and basically falling apart in front of your eyes, is you know, as a result of the relationship going very south very quickly, Nate was like, okay, here's a whole record that we had ready to go. I put my vocals on it. It's basically a rough, like a rough demo-y sounding record, which I just listened back to that record the other day, and I think it still sounds pretty good for it being all demo-based, really. Yeah, it doesn't sound like they recorded in a garage on a four-track or anything. He no. definitely made it sound like it was going to be really shitty, and then it was fine. Like <laughs> Yeah, no, I uh, I think it's a really good good record, and I kind of wish it would be interesting to see how it would have sounded with a full full on production going to a studio with someone producing it and so forth. But even with all that being said, like I think, and you know, Jason uh, Bold from Bullet made this comment. You know, John is pretty good at writing lyrics based on the environment that we live in currently, and uh, I feel like. If there was already pitch shifter music, maybe now would be a great time to write some lyrics for it. Because if he was inspired by the things that happened, you know, 20 some odd years ago, I can only imagine that there would be a lot of vitriol and all that kind of stuff for him to, to really get into some, some interesting lyrics about what we're going through currently. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I couldn't be more stoked for it if it is going to happen, you know. But I mean, I'm I'm kind of of the same mind as you, John. It's like, oh, reunion, reunion, reunion. You know, it's usually not very long before it's like, and a new record's gonna come out in, you know, however however long. You know, 
it's kind of like back whenever Brian Head Welch wasn't in corn. And then you started seeing all these like all these photos of like, yeah, no, it, no, it's fine, guy. I'm just hanging out with the corn guys. It's not, you know, it's not anything. And then like two days later, I'm officially rejoining corn as good. You know, you're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's just you, you get in a room with your buds again and you're like, whatever I was mad about, it's in the past. So, yeah, let's I, do this. I definitely think that's a day and age now, like the fun thing about technology being what it is, especially for a band like Pitch Shifter, you know, with them being so technologically based as far as their music is concerned is it doesn't require, you know, the guys to get into a room to hammer out ideas. It can definitely be, Hey, I came up with this, this sample. Hey, I came up with this idea. Oh, that goes kind of well with what I'm working on over here. And, you know, until they're ready. I mean, the other nice thing is, is if they just wanted to finish what they already have and then use that as, a launching point just to see if there's even any interest, like maybe start a a Kickstarter or whatever, as much as I'm not a fan of those typically, like I feel like this would be, you know, a great example of if the fans want it, then they will be willing to part with some money to hear these, these songs that have existed for the last, you know, 10 plus years. Yeah. I mean, if, if pitch shifter came back with a GoFundMe or a pledge music or whatever, you know, I'd throw them 20 bucks. Or so, you know, just to see. No, I'd probably do like forty with like the signed vinyl release really, and all that shit. You know, whatever it is that they would give you. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a really good way for bands to that are coming back to gauge if anybody still gives a shit. And that's that's really what a lot of these reunion shows are too. Is kind of this like let's see if we can still bank on the name alone. Well, I'm also hoping. I mean, I wasn't sure if the whole are you going to film any of the shows because I figured like filming shows takes a lot of fucking money and a lot of pre-planning. So with the fact that there's six shows, they're a couple of weeks away and there's not been anything meant. I mean, granted I I might've ruined a surprise with that. um, But it's still one of those things where to me, I feel like there's not necessarily a lot of money left on the table. I don't want to focus on the, the financials of everything, but I feel like the demand for pitch shifter is there as to what, it looks like in 2018 or beyond is up to the band to decide. But yeah, I mean, if, if John and the guys would decide like, yeah, let's go ahead and release this, uh, this collection of songs as a, as a proper album after the fact, that'd be cool. Uh, if it ends up being something completely different then you know, it is what it is. But I think today we are in a world where pitch shifter can exist in a lot of different formats and it really is however they want to do it. And I think that's the fun thing about this. And, and I guess that's kind of the, you know, kind of in wrapping up, I think that's just kind of a cool place to, to be as a band where you know that the, you have your fans that you've worked so hard to get and 20 some odd years later, now you can literally, you know, directly sell to the people that are interested if if so inclined. And that's exciting. Um, you know, I, I would be interested to hear. I think that's that's the most intriguing thing about the whole idea. If they do finish this record, a record that's 10 years old, but lyrically is going to be new. Like that's, that's so interesting to me. Yeah. I think it'll, I think it'll be cool if that's what they go with. They could just scrap it all and go all new, but maybe we'll never know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So as of the day we were recording this, we are just under a month away from the live debut of pitch shifter for the first time in nearly a decade. So yeah, if you would like to keep up with Pitch Shifter across the socials, Twitter and Facebook are simply Pitch Shifter, and if you would like to follow them on Instagram, pitchshifter.uk. And if you would like to keep up with Dan, Dan, where can people follow you? You can follow me on Twitter at Discuss Metal Dan. You can follow me on Facebook at Daniel Terry. <laughs> and uh, you can find my other podcast, Discography Discussion, at discussmetal.com. And if you would like to keep up with our show partner, Moshpit Nation, you can do such at moshpitnation.com. Facebook is Mosh Pit Nation West Capital MI. Twitter and Instagram are simply Mosh Pit Nation. And if you would like to keep up with our show sponsor, The Bean Bastard, you can do such at thebeanbastard.com. Twitter and Instagram are simply The Bean Bastard. Looks like the uh, Bean One is up and running. So if you are in the greater Buffalo area, be on the lookout for that black beauty and uh, get you some delicious <laughs> coffee. And if you would like to keep up with the podcast, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at John's Entitled Podcast. Tweet at us at John's Entitled Pod and email us at johnsentitledpod at gmail.com. And Dan's going to tell you about rating and reviewing and subscribing. 
We love rating, reviewing, and subscribing because it helps us come up in search results, and it also makes us feel nice in the process. Uh, if you have an opinion about John's Untitled Podcast, let us know what it is. Um, we're on pretty much every major podcasting platform you can get on. Uh, so if you uh, if you have the option to give us a rate or a review, do so. Um, we love uh, we love everything you guys have given us so far, and uh, we appreciate everybody that uh, is checking out the podcast brand new this week. Speaking of support, if you would like to support the show monetarily, you can come on the show as a sponsor yourself. Uh, I am going to tip my hat just a little bit and say that uh, we have some very, very, very good guests coming up uh, this week. All will be revealed when the episodes are officially recorded, and I have them, and I know that there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, but I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised by some of the names that I'm going to be dropping uh, in the next couple of days. And if you would like to support us monetarily as well, you can either do such by being a sponsor, by being a show sponsor, or you can go to patreon.com slash Johnson Title Podcast and support the podcast that way. We have uh, things as simple as a dollar to get you a shout out on the episode. Two dollars unlocks some bonus content. Uh, we've recorded three episodes at this point. Uh, probably going to be doing another one here pretty soon. And uh, yeah, just uh, any and all support is greatly appreciated. And without further ado, we are going to go ahead and end this episode out to a song as we always do, which is going to be Please Sir by Pitch Shifter as picked by John. So we're going to play that song. And then we will talk to you guys next time.